Hey everyone, it's uh, Sunday night, so I'm going to do another video here. <clears throat> to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not really all that excited about doing this one. Um, for a couple different reasons. Um, one, I'm just kind of feeling spiritually the lethargic, kind of just... Um, not very grateful today just kind of complaining and grumbling in my heart and and so just you know not really walking in the spirit just kind of a blase day and then um also when i read through this earlier in the week um i wasn't all that impressed with what i wrote um it's not one of my favorite articles and so I, I, I was just debating before here, like kind of praying it through, like, should I or should I not do this one? And kind of felt led spiritually, like maybe I should just skip it. Um, but I'm very anal when it comes to like um, lists and being detailed. And and so I'd, I'd written out a long time ago um, the order of these articles um, as I was planning on doing them. And, and so I really don't want to skip any. So, I'm going to, you know, prayerfully go into this, pray that the Lord blesses it. Um, I guess the, the one, there's a few reasons I wasn't too pumped about reading through this article. Number one, it, it's not really a topic that I'm, I'm uh, really passionate about. It's, it's not something that I have a lot of insight on, um, that being um, suffering. I know, like, I, I have one brother who, who's really, it, that kind of seems to be his heart. Um, that that particular issue and, and that type of ministry and so I believe there are people that are called to that um, it, it's not something that that I have a lot of familiarity with and perhaps that's because of the way the Lord has wired me I'm not really an emotional type person I'm kind of um, even even keeled just kind of um, I guess mild uh, not that I don't experience um, empathy or, or emotions um, like my friends will tell you you know I cry more than anybody else but that um, I, in my average day-to-day -day life I'm pretty I don't know what the word is satisfied with whatever life gives to me like even even when I was in jail um, back in my lost days and after salvation I was pretty content in jail like, I don't expect much out of life. Um, I do desire things. There's things I want. But um, I have uh, an adaptability to be pretty content in all things. So I, I don't think I experience suffering in the same way that I see a lot of other people experience suffering. It doesn't impact me as much. You know, when things go wrong in my life, um, the initial impact of it um, is certainly... Um, you know, it's like a like a wave that crashes over you. So you're hit with emotions initially, um, but I recover very fast um, from. And I suppose that's how I experience emotions too. I'm pretty pretty even throughout life. And then when I do have an emotion, it's a, an extreme peak, and then it comes back to even real quick. Or when I'm depressed, it's like a real quick low, and then I'm even again. I, I have a a, um, a recovery time that a lot of people that I know don't seem to have. They they experience more of, you know, they'll be in a valley for a while before they come out of it, or they'll be on this high for a, for a while before they come out of it. And so there's a lot of that, and and my life is more kind of like this, if that makes sense. And so the the way I experience suffering is like that too. When 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 something tragic happens in my life, there's an initial wave of emotion that brings me very low. Um, but then I'm able to adapt, and, and and not not that I'm able to. I suppose that's just a it's a blessing and kind of a hindrance. Like it's a blessing in that, that I'm able to come out of it so fast and recover so fast. And then the hindrance would be that I don't have as much empathy and compassion as a lot of people do because I don't understand it. It's like uh, if somebody's suffering, there there's a part of me that wants to say, you know, um, and I suppose this is matured in time. I'm not like this really anymore, but there, you know, just kind of a, well, you know, things happen, you know, snap out of it, you know, get on with life. And, and so 
with that, my giving you that insight into my heart, I, I don't really experience suffering in the same way that a lot of people seem to, and, and that it doesn't impact me as much um, in the long term. It, it, and, and so um, I'm speaking on a topic here that I really don't have a lot of experience in, and, and that's not always wise to do. And, and so that's why I hesitate or, or hesitated to do this article or not. Um, the other reason I was hesitant is um, I don't like the way it's written. I, I wrote this back in January of 2014. And um, as I was reading through it, I, I kind of wrote it in a way of expectancy of deliverance uh, from problems, from sufferings. And that, that's not really what I believe um, doctrinal, doctrinally or, or from a theological um, aspect. I think biblically we're... we're we're not always going to be delivered from our trials. We're not always, you know, we're we're going to suffer in this life. We're going to have trials and tribulations. Um, and, and the Lord's ministry in our heart is to cause us um, to not only be content in those things, but to rejoice in them, knowing that he's working a great work in us. Um, so, so and and I, I had that mindset when I wrote this. I've never been of the the um, charismatic persuasion where there's an expectancy of healing or expectancy of blessing. Um, that's that's not what I see in the scriptures. I see that um, we will suffer, and sometimes we won't be delivered from that suffering. But our hope is that in that suffering, the Lord is going to teach us um, holiness. Like there's a saying by, I think it was Pastor John Piper who said the Lord is more, or it might have been Pastor Paul Washer, I'm not sure, but um, said that the Lord is more concerned about our holiness rather than our comfort. And and I believe that to be true. We're being, we were predestined to be conformed to his image. And so the ultimate goal of a Christian's life, the whole reason the Lord has saved you, um, if you're saved watching this, the whole reason that, that you've been redeemed is to be conformed into Christ's image, to become Christ-like. And, and so with that being the end goal of all things, with that being um, the purpose of your life, in order to produce Christ-like character in you, you sometimes may have to suffer. You sometimes may have to go through because suffering produces patience and patience produces um, long suffering and long suffering produces hope. I'm, I'm ruining that verse, but and then hope produces character or character produces hope. I forget how it's said, but basically, um, and, and it's through those trials and tribulations that that contentment and joy and peace and and. Um, compassion and passiv passivity and mercy and and things like that and are created in us and so if like people would say like if you get cancer to pray for deliverance from the cancer i would say that the the more godly prayer would be that the lord would be glorified in your cancer and so that would mean that even if it meant that you weren't to be healed from that if god was going to be more glorified in that and that you were going to be created more like Christ through your suffering, that you would learn patience and humility and, and long suffering and, and develop those. If that's the means that God has to use to produce those characteristics in you, then so be it. That is the goal of a Christian is to be conformed to the image of Christ, not to have a comfortable worldly life, not to have health, wealth, and prosperity. Um, those are temporal things, and and we can have them, but they're not the end goal. They're not they're not the means of our joy. They're not the means um, of our satisfaction. Our ultimate goal is to be like Christ, and and if it takes suffering to get there. If it takes hardships to get there, that's what we need. And so that's my mindset. And I didn't necessarily write this article. Um, like the way this is worded, that that foundational understanding doesn't really spring forth out of this. It seems like as you as I read through this earlier in the week that that um, I was more looking at deliverance from your sufferings, um, and and. 
so I didn't like the way it was written. I don't remember where my mindset was when I wrote this. I think because I have a lot of people in my life that do deal with much suffering. And, and I think I was trying to offer some encouragement um, to write uh, an article of encouragement to encourage people through their suffering. That, and, and with the emphasis that the Lord may deliver you out of these. And it just came across like, you know, your joy is in the deliverance. And that's not the truth. Your joy is in the suffering, understanding that God is working holiness in your life. Um, so so that's the goal uh, of, of the article here. And um, so as I'm reading through this, I may ad lib some things. I may interject some things or um, clarify on that. Um, just to get that point across um, because that's the more important point and um so we'll see how this goes we'll, we'll read through it and we'll pray that the lord blesses it and that he uses it for his glory um so it's joy and suffering it's based on um second corinthians 12 10. uh before getting into it if you want to pray with me i'd appreciate it Lord, I, I pray, I thank you that you gave me that opportunity there to, to clarify um, my heart behind this article, Lord, and what I, what I hope to get across in this. Um, there's not a lot of enthusiasm and zeal in my heart right now, Lord, so I pray that, that you would be um, glorified in this, Lord, that your word would go forth, Lord, that you would, that this would offer encouragement for somebody who's, who's suffering and going through hardships, that, that you would encourage me and minister to my heart in this, Lord, and that um, you would keep me humble, keep my eyes off of myself, Lord, erase all pride and arrogance and, and seeking to please man, um, just please help me to lift my eyes to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I, I need you in this. I'm, I'm, I'm weak in this article, Lord, in, in that I don't have a lot of enthusiasm. and I don't um, have a lot of hope in the article itself that, that it'll bring glory to you, but I do have hope in you, Lord, and I, I know that, that you can edify me and, and comfort me in this letter and that You'll bless it to the ears of anybody who's listening, Lord, that you can be magnified and be made much of through your word, Lord. I pray that you give me wisdom, Lord, and that uh, you keep me free from error, Lord, that, that anywhere I'm in error, that, that you just let it go in one ear and out the other, that people forget about it, Lord. And, uh, whatever's true, whatever's good, whatever's righteous, whatever, whatever's holy, that that would stick with people, Lord. And, that they would look to your word as a source of hope, Lord, and that they would endure hardships uh, knowing that you're producing Christ-like character in them and that you are good and that you will be magnified even in suffering, Lord, especially through suffering. Teach us to, to, to joy in our suffering knowing that it's working ultimate good, Lord. Um, be with me as I read this, Lord. I, I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, as I stated, this is called Joy and Suffering. And it's a commentary on 2 Corinthians 12.10. Uh, if you can't listen to this live or if you can't catch the whole thing, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch this in all my, my videos at your convenience. Uh, it's King Ram 417. That's K, my middle initial. Ingram, my last name, 417. Um, I'll try to get this one posted as soon as possible. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm uploading the um, Romans chapter 15 video uh, right now, so you can catch that on there as well. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Um, so when I, okay, so I know, I know the context here, uh, because when I wrote this, uh, we had actually been looking at this verse in a Bible study on the previous, previous night. And, uh, this verse ha had stuck out to me. Um, so in this verse, or in the context of this chapter, chapter, Paul has been discussing, um, how that when he is shown to be weak, 
Um, Christ is shown to be strong in him and through him. Our weakness amplifies the glory of Jesus Christ in us. Um, so how does this work? When we're put through the hard trials of life and we're able to exemplify a complete trust in Jesus Christ, uh, which that trust will then produce a contentment within us in that trial, which then produces joy. Um, so, and, and when that happens during our trials, uh, the world, uh, those that are lost, um, will be shocked and dumbfounded by this. Uh, they're going to look at that situation and go, what is this? How is this person able to endure these hardships with, su with such strength, with such joy, with such contentment? And there's that verse that says, always be ready to give reason of the hope that is in you. And, and I heard one preacher say, how often has somebody come up to you and asked you about the hope that is in you? Um, could it be because you're not exemplifying that hope? You're not handling your trials and tribulations in the way that God would want you to with a trust in him, with a satisfaction in him? Are we, see, I, th I think the problem is, is we, the whole goal of Christianity or the whole mindset of Christianity is that our hope is in Christ. And, and when our hope and, and satisfaction is found in him, when we're focused on him, and, and, and all we want is Him. He's our desire. He's our goal. He, he's our focus. He is what we want. Um, then no matter what occurs in life, we're going to be satisfied because He promises to never leave us, never forsake us. We're always going to be drawing nearer to Him. So even when everything is falling apart around you, you're still growing in Christ. You're still... Um, aiming towards and gaining uh, more of him, becoming more like him, drawing near to him. And so you're always going to have that satisfaction. The problem becomes um, is that we start focusing on things of the world. We start setting our hope on these things. We start finding our satisfaction on things, uh, whether that's family, whether that's money, whether that's uh, prosperity, whether that's health, whether that's um, hobbies that bring you joy, whatever it is, you're finding your joy in something other than Christ. And, and we live in a society, especially in America, where we have an abundance of things. And so it's very easy to lose our focus and to start focusing on things. Um, we start doing well in life and we start saying, well, you know, I can now get these things. I can, I can have a good car. I can have a good home. I can, I can have a uh, clothing. I can have my hobbies. And, and we start to focus on them. I can start to have fishing. Or, or whatever it is that you enjoy and, and you start to find satisfaction in those things inevitably something is going to occur that affects your pursuit of those things where those things are going to go away or be hindered and it's then what, that we start to complain and grumble and and it's because we're no longer focused on he is no longer our satisfaction these things are our satisfaction whether that's marriage whatever it is we're finding joy in something other than him and so when we not when when those things fail as they always will, we're dissatisfied and we complain. And so that, that's the problem that we have in society. And that's why people don't see the hope that we have in us. Because that's how the world lives. The world finds its satisfaction in things. And so if we're living like that, then we're no different than the world. And the world's never going to look to us as a, as a source of something unique and different. And, and they're not going to ask us about our hope. But if our focus is on him and we're satisfied in him so that even in the midst of trials where th while things are falling apart around us the death of a loved one um uh, uh, um 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 an announcement of cancer um a loss of a job a uh, loss a, a home fire whatever it is those things aren't our satisfaction our satisfaction is in Christ and so although it, there may be a hurt and a loss, um, we're still satisfied in Christ and we still, we're still trusting our sovereign God, knowing that he is working all things for our good. So that no matter what occurs in life, no matter how hard it is, no matter what kind of loss it is, it is gain because the Lord is going to use those things for our betterment. He's going to use those things to produce uh, Christ-like character in us. He's going to draw us closer to himself 
through those things. And so we're able to find satisfaction and joy in that. And, and to the point where, and that's what we're getting at here, is that we ought to have joy in them. James says to rejoice in our tribulations. So it, we ought to get to the point where even in the midst of heartache and hardships, we rejoice because we're now recognizing that as the means of God producing Christ-like character in us. So that anytime something hard happens in life, we now look at it as, okay, I see this as the fiery furnace that's going to purify me, as gold in a furnace that works out the impurifications. You know, if gold had feelings, it, w it wouldn't feel good to be in the furnace. But if it had wisdom and understanding, knowing that the outcome of going through that furnace is purification. And so if we are looking to Christ as our satisfaction and, and our goal is to be more like him, because as we grow more like him, we grow closer to him because that is the means by which we are per conformed to his image by drawing near to him. And so in each trial we face and this is something we learn because paul learned to be content the scriptures say so as we're faced with trials and we go through them we come out the other side and we go i now have more christ-like character in me i can now see that he produced patience in me that he produced long suffering in me that he produced compassion in me that he rid me of certain pride or certain sin and so we can see this growth occurring through it to the point where now if a trial comes we can actually have a sort of excitement and an and, and, and anticipation in it knowing that it's going to work righteousness in us so we can look at it and go okay God is doing something in me. And, and then James says to ask for wisdom in our trials. Okay, Lord, what is this? What am I learning? What what characteristic are you producing in me? And so there there can almost be an anticipation. Not and and, and so there is a duality because it's not that we don't have emotions that we're not going to suffer through things. Um that that's you know, suffering is a reality. But with the knowledge of righteousness and holiness, we, we can learn to rejoice in these sufferings. And so the world is going to look at that and go, what is this? How is this person rejoicing in their hardships? Um, what is this hope that you have? Um, you know, you think of Paul and Silas singing hymns while in the dungeon, while in prison. Um, what, did the, what must have those other prisoners have thought? What must have the guard have thought? Um, to the point when the guard, you know, thought they'd escaped, it, you know, he was going to kill himself because he was going to be punished. And then when he saw he was still there, he asked them, what must I do to be saved? You know, he recognized something in these guys. Um, but when, when we're able to rejoice in our sufferings, the result is that the evidence of Christ in our lives is magnified. As we respond to trials in trust, um, rather than an anxiety, uh, panic, or depression, um, you know, the same things that the world exhibits when they're faced with trials. Uh, but when we, we do the opposite, people cannot help but stand in awe and wonder who this Jesus Christ is. Who is this that they, they claim their hope in? How are they able to endure these hardships with joy? How are they not worried? Um, one thing, and, and, and I, I pray that the Lord uh, has used this situation in spite of um, my poor character at work, but um, my work is laying everybody off. And so I, I've seen over the course of the last several months kind of people in a, in a frantic panic, scrambling to create resumes and create LinkedIn accounts and looking for work. And I just kind of been sitting back and, and chill, like, you know, whatever. And boss sometimes would be like, you know, aren't you going to create a LinkedIn account? Aren't you trying to do this and, you know, develop, you know, reach out to different things and, 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 and get things settled? And I'm just like, nah, man, I'm all right. You know, things will work out. And, um... I hope that they see that that's Christ in me. Um, but that that's that's kind of a, a mild example of that, that we don't have that anxiousness and worry and panic that the world does. Um, so in this 2 Corinthians 12 verse, uh, what situations uh, do we find Paul talking about specifically? Um, and he mentions several things here, and I just want to look at them. Uh, number one, he says infirmities. Um, this word means like sicknesses, diseases, illness, uh, reproaches to the body. 
So when the world is sick or ill or disabled, um, they usually will respond in a woe is me type attitude. Why has this happened to me? Oh, this is horrible. What am I going to do? Um, depression and utter disappointment um, are shown in that individual. So now if the Christian responds in that same way, um, it can lead to a person looking at us and saying, what good is Christ then? Uh, that Christian is just as miserable as I am. What hope does Christianity offer that I don't have? Um, and that does a great disservice to our God. Excuse me. Um, and and so instead, and, and you think about the, these um, charismatic circles where they go to healing meetings. They're, they're, it's the same thing. They're, they're, they're seeking a healing as their hope rather than seeking Christ as their hope. Um, we don't need to be healed. As I was writing this, I was thinking about a woman, um, uh, if you've heard of her, Joni Erickson Tata, um, a Christian woman who's in a wheelchair. She's a quadriplegic. And, um, I don't think she was born that way. If I'm, if I remember correctly from her testimony, I think she was in a diving accident where she dove into a pool and dove into shallow water and broke her neck and was paralyzed. Um, from the neck down. She doesn't have a use of her arms or her legs. And um, some of the quotes that she has about suffering are phenomenal. She, she, she has actually stated that she wouldn't want to be healed um, because this, this, this disability has caused her to draw nearer to Christ, has produced Christ-like character in her. And that's almost bringing me to tears right now as I talk about it, because that's exactly what we're talking about. That is that Christ-like character where through that suffering, she is able to magnify the Lord and say, he is so much more worthy than the use of my arms and my legs. Without the, because of this infirmity, because of this disease, I've grown nearer to Christ. I've grown I, I've grown um, closer to my Savior. I, I have more of the Savior's heart in me and, and in my character. And I've got several of her books on my shelf. I haven't read in any of them. I should because the quotes that I've read from her are fantastic. Um, she seems to be a genuine sister in the faith with a real heart for the Lord. And, and that's a beautiful thing. And so, you know, if we react that same way to our infirmities, if we get cancer and, and, and we are able to rejoice in it, knowing that the Lord is going to use this to draw me nearer to him, even in our regular sicknesses, in our, there's a reason that you get the flu. There's a reason you get a cold and it's not to complain and grumble. It, it's to teach you perseverance or or long suffering or whatever it is. The Lord has a purpose in it, and it's to, it's to produce Christ like character in you and draw you nearer to Him. And so, if we re, in our infirmities, if we resolve in our hearts that it is Christ who is in direct control of all things, including that disease. You did not get sick by chance. It is not the devil that attacked you, although that might be the means that God uses to attack you, like the, like in Job. When Job was attacked, the devil had to get permission to attack Job. And, and then Job never credited the devil with it. He didn't say, the devil has done this to me. He says, God has done this to me. The devil is God's devil. He's just a tool, a vessel, a means. God is sovereign and in control of all things. If you get cancer, if you get a disease, God is the sovereign orchestrator behind that. I want to be careful how I phrase that. Um, he has designed such things to produce holiness in you, to draw him closer to you. There's a reason for it. He is in control of all things, and he is working all things. That includes our sicknesses, our diseases, our disabilities, our infirmities. He is using those for our good. And that good is not our, necessarily our healing or our comfort. That good is our holiness. And, and so when we have that understanding, then we can stand in trust. 
We can know that God is using this infirmity to glorify himself and to produce Christ-like character in us. Uh, that is the goal of sanctification. So in response to these things, Paul says that we should have joy. Um, true trust leads to joy. If you know that God is going to use your situation to make you holier and to magnify his name amongst the lost, um, then it should cause us to rejoice in the face of our troubles. Not that we're not going to have heartache and sorrow, not that it's not going to hurt and then we're going to cry and weep out to God, but ultimately underneath that, there's this this um, dichotomy within the Christian of being being able to experience two things simultaneously, being able to experience sorrow and and hurt and an underlying joy and contentment and trust. Um, when we doubt, uh, which is faithful faithlessness, um, that destroys our joy. And it whispers in our ear that that's the tempter, the devil, uh, whispering our, in our ear, yeah, but what if, you know, and fill in the blank, what if this cancer leads to your death? What if this is extremely painful? What about the finances? What about this? If we give in to that doubt, um, then we fall right back into that same attitude that the lost have. We're, we're going to be complaining and grumbling and having that woe is me type attitude. And the image that that creates to the lost world is that we're no better off than they are. That we that our hope is no more real than theirs. And, you know, we shouldn't have that. Um, the second obstacle that Paul discusses is reproaches. Um, I think this word can have two different connotations. Um, it can mean criticism, um, a negative reproach against us. And um, I wrote here that it can also be a reprimand, um, but I think that's wrong. I think I did a strong look at this word, and it is a negative. It's a verbal attack, a reproach. Um, so how we respond to, to verbal attacks is important. If the world, uh, it, if the world gets criticized, if the lost uh, faces criticism, uh, verbal abuse, it usually responds in bitterness um, or hurt, uh, um, a, a defense mechanism, uh, um, ve seeking a vengeance. And uh, either their pride says, who is this person to speak against me? Um, or it causes them to feel attacked and then wanting vengeance. Um, and, and if the world is corrected, uh, well, I'm going to leave that part out again. Uh, see, and that's what I talk about, what me not liking this. Uh, I think I had a misunderstanding of the word reproach, and so I was looking at it as both a negative and a positive. Um, but I, I do believe it's, the word just means a, a verbal attack on you. So um, if we respond to, to verbal criticism or, or slander or attacks in the same way that the world does, what kind of witness is that? If we get vengeful, if we get bitter, um, if, if, if our pride kicks in and, and we attack back, we backbite, um, or we, we seek verbal vengeance on them, it's such a disgusting image. It, it's the same thing that lost people would do. It shows no hope. It shows no trust in the Lord. It's saying, Lord, you know, I'm taking matters into my own hands here because this person is attacking me and I need to defend myself. Um, but Paul says that our response, and, and Paul is speaking by way of the Holy Spirit. He says that our response should be joy. Uh, when we're faced with this kind of verbal criticism, this kind of verbal slander or attack, our hearts should say, God is going to get glory in this in spite of me. I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to offer a, 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 a vengeful backbite. I can remain silent like Jesus remains silent in the face of his accusers, trusting himself to the sovereign hand of the Lord, knowing that even these verbal attacks are under the sovereign control of God. There's a purpose and a reason for this. So if I can remain humble and silent, um, God is going to be glorified in me, and I'm going to learn Christ-like character in that. Um, so, you know, it, it, and, and that's, you know, whether we bring it upon ourselves or vice versa, if it's just an attack, 
if we just brush it off and let it go and just humble ourselves and allow ourselves to be submissive to the sovereign hand of the Lord to say, whatever you have for me, Lord, I'm okay with it. Whatever criticisms, whatever, it, you know, if it's deserved, then humble me, Lord, and help me to seek forgiveness. And if it's not deserved, I trust you to, to work righteousness in it. Um, and, and by doing that, uh, we're recognizing that God's the only one we need to please. We don't need to. We don't need to offer on a def, a, a defense of ourselves. Um, we're just seeking to be obedient to Christ. How do I respond to this, Lord? He responded in silence, in meekness, in humility. So, okay, Lord, I will respond in meekness, humility, and silence, and trust myself to you. And when we do that, the world's not going to understand it again. They're going to look at this and 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 awe, like Pilate. Pilate said to Jesus, "Don't you know I have the the power to crucify you? Aren't you going to offer a defense?" And and so Pilate didn't understand it. He couldn't understand that this man is facing crucifixion. All he has, Pilate wanted a reason to let Jesus go. All Jesus had to do probably was offer any sort of reasonable defense. Pilate, I didn't do these things they're accusing me of. Um, they're lying. They're it's they're obviously envious, you know, and and. They just hate uh, the authority that I have, and they, they think that I'm stealing from their authority. Pilate probably would have let him go, uh, but he faced a, this criticism in silence, and that caused Pilate to just, in awe and wonder, what is this? You know, And, and the world's going to do the same. If we respond in that humble meekness and lowliness, the world's not going to understand it. It's going to glorify the Lord. Um, so the third issue that Paul talks about here is necessities. Um, and what he's talking about is being without the things that we need, the necessities of life, uh, whether that's water or food or, or, or uh, shelter, whatever it is, clothing, finances, um, you know, in necessities, having wants, having needs, um, being without. When the world is faced with financial struggles, when the world is faced with hunger or thirst or, or those types of struggles, uh, their response is one of desperation and, and often depression. Uh, again, it's a, a woe is me type attitude that's shown. And the mindset of what am I going to do? What, how am I going to pay my bills? I just lost my job. Woe is me. You know, how are these bills going to get paid? What am I going to do? Um, it represents hopelessness. Uh, if we exhibit, exhibit those same attitudes in the face of these situations, what does that say to the world in regards to our God? It makes a horrible witness. Here we are claiming to be Christians, claiming to have faith in Christ, to trust in him, to be our provider and our sustainer. And then a hardship comes and we panic. Um, what does that show the world? Does it not show that, that Christ is not worthy of trust? Does that not do such a great disservice to the Lord? But if we respond in trust, if we again realize that God is in control and we remember his promises that, that he takes care of, of the birds of the field and that he clothes the flowers and that, that will he not do so much for us and that we, uh, we don't have to go and ask for food and, and shelter because, like the Gentiles do because the Lord knows we have need of those things before we even ask. And, and he's sovereignly in control of everything. Um, he produced money out of a fish's mouth. When, when Jesus told, uh, I forget who it was, Peter, to, to pay taxes, a gold coin was pulled from a fish's mouth. And he rained manna from heaven in the desert. When the Jews didn't have food, he made food come down from the skies. He is able to provide for us. He has the power um, to produce. He will pay our bills. I think about a testimony about, uh, well, I'm not going to share testimonies because uh, there, there is a chance that, you know, the Lord sometimes, for the for His all wise purposes, may make us homeless. You know, He may put us in a van or under a bridge or in a tent. He may put us in a jail cell. Um, he will. He may. There's there's all sorts of scenarios that could occur. But but if our satisfaction is Him and we're trusting in Him, then we'll be able to rejoice even in the midst of that, knowing that I don't need to worry about drink and food and shelter. My God is enough. 
whether I live or die, um, he will be glorified and holiness will be produced in me. We cannot panic. Uh, when we remember that God is in control, and when we keep in mind that he is working that righteousness in us, that he is working all things for our good, and that good being our holiness, we can rejoice in these situations. Um, recognizing that if we're in no-win situations, um, when we're able to trust God in the midst of that, it is going to amaze the world. They're not going to understand it. Um, and when we patiently wait for God, trusting his sovereign hand to give us what he sees as, as fit for us, as good for us, um, it causes joy and excited anticipation. I, I know the Lord's going to do good for me. I can trust him. The world can't understand that, and, and that will glorify Christ. Um, I think about, I, I was thinking about this one time um, as I was sitting uh, in my car during lunch and it was just for a brief moment but um, I, I was sitting there um, well I'll tell two stories because this isn't the one I initially wanted to tell but um, I was thinking I was just sitting in my car and for a brief second I thought you know thinking about the end times I think I was just thinking about the state of the world and and the the chaos that we're currently in and 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 how it just seems like we're on the verge uh, of just um, complete chaos, especially in America. Like it, it's like, um, is this the end of America that we're facing? Is it the end of the world that we're facing? And we're just on in very perilous times. And I was thinking about that, and I was imagining all these big buildings around me, these big ten, fourteen story buildings. I was picturing them just crumbling and and the world just kind of shaking and in the midst of this i had this image of just peace and glory in my heart and you think about that psalm that says even if ten thousand fall at my side i won't worry you know i trust in the lord and it's like even in the midst of that chaos i can have peace just knowing my sovereign god is in control of these things that none of this is just occurring by chance he is directing all things and it's for his good it's for his glory and for my good he has promised that to me and so i can trust him in that and then another time i was thinking about um just rejoicing in trials and 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 being hopeful in the trials and i had to temper myself because I was, I was laying on my bed and i was thinking about it and i was like Man, every time a trial had, I can't remember my exact thought process, but the basic premise is that every time a trial or tribulation occurs, some sort of new level of righteousness is produced in us. Some new level of holiness is created in us. We're, we're drawn closer to Christ. And I got so excited about that. And I was thinking about my car breaking down at the same time. And I got excited about the thought of my car breaking down to the point where I was all, almost like, man, I can't wait for my car to break down. Just because I was seeing that the Lord was going to use that if that occurred to produce patience and 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 whatever he was going to produce righteousness in me and, and that's the heart of what we're getting at here even in necessities even if you're you lose your job and you don't know how you're going to pay your bills um if you respond in panic and desperation that shows no trust in the lord that's such a bad image to the world it, it but if we're able to rejoice in that and have hope and just know that that god's got this it's going to be okay um that that is a beautiful picture that that we show the world of christ uh the fourth thing that paul mentions is persecutions um and and persecutions is just to be hated by the world which jesus which jesus said that we would be um people by nature hate to be the oddball they hate to be the one that stands out. They hate to be the one that's picked on. Um, no one wants to be excluded. Nobody likes to be mocked. Um, so as a result, when the world faces that kind of thing, when the world faces that kind of persecution, uh, they typically respond in one of two ways. Uh, one, they change their ways or their ideas. Um, they, they conform to, to, to the persecutors. They perform conform to society so that they fit in they adapt um, to the ways and ideas of the world um, and they drop whatever notion it was that they had that was causing persecution 
or two, they hide um, whatever it is that's causing persecution and fear. They become silent in that thing. If they take a stand for an issue or they have something that they believe in that becomes mocked and, and, and persecuted, uh, they just hide it, you know. So if we respond in the same way, and, and these are two things the Lord told us. Uh, he told us that we're going to be hated, and he told us not to hide our light, not to be ashamed of him. If we're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of us. He told us to, to not put our light under a bushel, but to, to set it on the hillside for all to see. We are to glorify the Lord. We are to speak about the Lord, and knowing that the world is going to hate that, knowing that the vast majority, uh, because narrow is the way and there's few on it, and broad is the way of destruction and there's many on it. So it's the few versus the many. The few that stand for Christ are going to be outnumbered, are going to be mocked, are going to be hated, are going to be persecuted. If we respond by hiding our faith, by becoming silent, you know, people, oh, you're a Christian, and all of a sudden you're going, oh man, I guess I'll just keep my Christianity to myself. Or people going, oh, you're a Christian, and you you go, ah, forget this Christian thing. Nah, I'm with you guys, you know, and or or whatever it is, you know. A, that's very scary. It could show that you're not saved at all, um, because there's that seed that that um, immediately springs up, but then is met with persecution and withers away because it had no root. And so if you don't have the root of Jesus Christ in you, and, and, and when persecution comes, you flee from the things of Christ, or you forsake taking a stand for these things, or you hide them, um, A, you're doing such a great disservice to the Lord, um, but more so than that, um, that's, a, that's a scary, uh, revelatory thing that's showing uh, perhaps you aren't saved. Perhaps you don't really have the root of Jesus Christ in you. Um, instead, we ought to recognize what an honor it is to suffer for our king. There's that verse that says that um, uh, it, we should count it, I uh, forget how it says, but it, that it's a blessing, not only that we know him, but that we've been counted worthy to suffer for his namesake. Um, when, when we're persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ, A, you ought to rejoice in that because it's showing you that you're reflecting him. The world hates him and hates the light. And so if they're hating you for taking a stand for him, that shows that his light is on you. It's showing, wow, this I'm reflecting the light of Jesus Christ that ought to produce joy in you. And, and so it's a tremendous proof. I remember thinking about this in my in early in my faith when I would struggle with the idea of whether or not I was saved you know facing persecution is a tremendous proof of salvation now we can fake that so we don't want to rely upon that um, I think there's people there's legalistic Pharisee types that go out and do street preaching hoping that they're persecuted so you can't just use persecution as the end-all be-all um, of your salvation but but it is a joy to know I'm suffering for my Lord's sake. When we face persecution, we should remember our king and be in awe that we get to follow in his footsteps, that, that we're on the right path. If, if, if the world is hating me for standing for him, then, then, then obviously I am standing for him that I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right path because Jesus told us this would happen. He told us the world would hate us. Darkness hates the light. And, and when we're able to rejoice in that and celebrate in that, that's going to utterly confuse the world. They're not going to be able to understand that, and it's going to cause them to glorify the Creator. Um, so the last thing that Paul mentions here is distresses. And what is meant by distresses is suffering and pain. Um, so how does the world respond to such things? Um, usually in gloom and doom and despair. Um, or they, they seek out um, uh, self medication through, through medication through drugs or alcohol or whatever to alleviate their suffering and pain. So if we respond in the same manner, what does that say about God? Um, but if we're able to patiently and, and joyfully endure through our suffering, God is magnified. And I'm not saying that's easy. Pain is not an easy thing to deal with. Pain is pain. It hurts. Um, but if we can pray in our prayer closet and cry out to the, to the Lord, 
um, to, to bring um, comfort and, and, and to alleviate our pain or, or to give us the strength to persevere and to glorify Him in it. Um, if, if we can take these painful and des despairing situations and remember that we serve the King of all things, that He's in control of this and that He has designed this for a purpose, for our for his glory and for for our sanctification and that he promises to work righteousness and justice and loving kindness um then we can be assured that what he is doing is the best thing that can happen and so even in the midst of our painful situations we can bring him glory and the world is going to stand in utter shock at that they're not going to understand it they're going to wonder who is this king of glory who is this one that they trust in who is this name that they call upon jesus christ that they're able to endure all these things with peace and contentment and joy and satisfaction um when we are weak like that he is strong he is magnified and that's how paul wraps up this verse if we see our sicknesses our failures our needs, our wants, our sufferings, and our hard times as opportunities controlled and orchestrated and designed by God in order to glorify His name and to produce in us holiness, then our responses to all those hard situations should be in excited joy and anticipation, even in the hurt. It, yes, things hurt. Yes, we have emotional responses. But again, that underlying foundation of anticipatory joy, knowing that God is producing something good, knowing that righteousness is going to come out of this, um, when those hard times come, God is producing opportunities um, to magnify himself in our lives to the world. We're, be, we're being given an opportunity uh, to witness to the world the great worthiness of our God. We're saying to the world, see these mountains in front of me? I can endure because of him who is in me. Look at this one who is able to give me joy and peace in the midst of this. And, and again, that just makes me think of Joni Erickson Tata, um, such a wonderful uh, witness of this. I mean, what greater hardship that could there be than to be a quadriplegic, to not have use of your limbs, um, but to rejoice and to glorify God in that. Um, it's so beautiful. And, and again, it just brings me to tears thinking about it. Just, you know, I, I highly recommend that you look into this woman because she is an example of this joy in suffering. And it's so um, beautiful. It's so endure, endearing. It's it's um, a great thing. And so um, just think about the hardships that you're going through right now. Think about the situations that you're in. And then think about how your response to those situations is reflecting your king to the world. What is it saying about your Lord? Um, I know the hard times that I face and, and hard times that will come. And so I'm preaching to myself. I'm not saying that I always perfectly handle this as well, but that is to my shame. You know, I want to be able um, to respond in joy. I want to be able to respond in trust. And so I want to show the world that my hope is not in things. My hope's not in my health. My hope is not in my job or my finances um, or my possessions or my home or my my loved ones. That's not where my hope is. My hope is in him and he's not going anywhere and, and he'll be with me in the midst of these. I want to be able to, to symbolically brag about the worthiness of our king and, 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 and about how he's able to cause us to endure through our weaknesses and, and to say, look at what our king is worth. Look, look at this king we serve. And, and isn't that what you want to show the world as well? Um, so that's what I have here. Um, uh, I, again, uh, if you look at the article, because I always link the article in the YouTube video, um, it won't be exactly how this video was stated because I, I, I ad-libbed some of it. Um, but um, if you didn't get to watch the whole thing, you're just jumping in here at the end. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch this in all my videos at your convenience. Uh, King Ram 417 K, my middle initial, Ingram, my last name, 417. 
I'll try to get this one posted as soon as possible. All right, guys. I love you. Talk to you later.